it's my pleasure to be here. Like all of you will be in a, in a few years, I am an alumnus of this institution. So it's always great to be back in as an alumnus. So the talk, I started this talk with the title, Disruptive Future of the Way We Will Live, Learn and Work. And I thought, maybe it's not that, that disruptive. So I removed the word disruptive. I'll let you decide whether it's disruptive or not. And uh, <clears throat> mainly, uh, I wanted to talk about the impact of uh, universal access to multimedia information. If you could access anything you want, anytime, anywhere, what would that mean to the way we live, learn, and work? Is the main topic. In general, disruptive innovation have caused all kinds of havoc throughout history. And many companies have gone bankrupt even in the last 30, 40 years because of disruptive innovation. There's a famous book by uh, Clayton Christensen on uh, Innovator's Dilemma about this topic. If you haven't read it, it's a business school monograph. <coughs> you would enjoy reading it anyway. And, uh, but the interesting thing is, if you look at the last <coughs> hundred years, hundred years ago, we had uh, no cars, we had uh, no gas stations, we had no electricity, we had no phones, we had no radio or TV. When I say we had no electricity, I don't mean we didn't know about electricity. That was known as early as in the 1800s when Faraday was working on it. But routine use by ordinary citizens of electricity did not happen until the first and second decades of uh, 1900s. Fifty years ago, we didn't have any computers, we had no internet, we didn't know about DNA, we didn't have satellite communication, we didn't have iPods and iPhones and Kindle Fire where you can instantly access books. And we are just beginning, we are just beginning in this innovation. The next 20 years, the next 50 years will be as dramatic, if not more, than the last 50 years. And uh, you should not be counting in terms of 50 years terms. Maybe 20 years is the right frame because the innovation is accelerating. And this is the, the serious problem for all of us trying to plan what we should teach the students, what research we should do, how we should plan our lives, how we should plan our countries, everything becomes a problem because you don't know, you can't predict the future. You can't. And this is nothing new. If you go back through the ages, since the invention of fire, discovery of the fire, and gunpowder, and nuclear power, in between, we had lots of other innovations. Uh, I don't want to go into them, but we, we can if you want later. But uh, all of them have had similar impact on the way we live, learn, and work. There have been three information revolutions you can think about. Maybe more, but we'll talk about it in three. First was the invention of writing around uh, 3,000 3, BC uh, with hieroglyphics and so on. And uh, the impact of that was you were able to learn from the experiences of your previous generations. You would write down what you knew and the next generation could benefit from. Before that, it was whatever you could remember and, and tell your sons and grandsons who then might forget, whatever experience you can communicate with all that you have. With the invention of writing, it became possible to communicate knowledge across generations, hundreds of years. Then, there were other inventions that were equally important, but you know, I, I didn't put here. In India, 
our mathematicians invented the positional numbering system at zero. That turned out to have an immense impact on the way people could count and think and measure and so on. And uh, there, you know, at that time, there was a flowering of magical squares where you can add in any diagonal way, any way you want, and the numbers would add up to the same. And there was a competition to say, can you make one a 5 by 5 square, a 7 by 7 square, or a 10 by 10 square? Amazing that they could think that much and organize the numbers in such a way so that they could all add up to the same. Later, the Chinese invented the paper. That was one of the things I wish we had done too, but we didn't. And we have stuck to writing on leaves, on leaves, until very recently, 200 years ago. So the historical records that we have of our history and culture are much less. And only the Ashoka pillars and uh, things like that. For example, if you ever have time to go to South India, you should visit Tanjavur. Tanjavur uh, used to be the capital of uh, Chola kings. Around 500 AD, uh, Raja Raja Chola built this huge temple, Shiva temple. Amazing, if you just see it, will be you know, kind of mesmerized. But what was interesting to me was, in, in all the granite stones, they, he has inscribed all the victories, not only in this country, in all of Southeast Asia. They, they had troops and ships going to Malaysia and Indonesia and all of them, and conquering at that point in time. I didn't know that. That was a, that's a historical record of Raja Raja Chola. It's very interesting. That could not have been communicated to us without the invention of writing. So anyway, around uh, 1700 or so, Gutenberg invented the printing press, which again revolutionized the way we are able to communicate information. And in this case, uh, it, what we call it democratization. Before that, it was only whoever could laboriously copy things and keep the records uh, that could learn. After that, if the average person could buy a book, have access to a book, and Benjamin Franklin actually created the first lending library in Philadelphia uh, because it was such an amazing thing for anybody to be able to go buy, borrow a book and uh, read it and then return it. Now, in the last 50 years, we are entering into the third information revolution. This information revolution has three legs, the three C's as I call it. The invention of the computer, the invention of the internet, the communication networking, and now we're in the last leg, which is the content the content of uh, uh, access to on, on demand. Uh, I'll say more about this. So basically, my prediction is the three of these together, or the first two are the necessary conditions for the third one, will lead to a major disruptive change in our, in our lives. In the, in, it's already leading to it, I'll show you in a minute and it will be even more over the next 20, 30 years. And I think it's an interesting future to ponder and then say, how does that impact the way we are going to organize ourselves? What should IIT do in Karakpur? What should each of us, what research should we do? What businesses should we start? All of these things kind of impact on, on the future. So basically, Online access to all information. In the past, in libraries, mostly you had books and a few other things perhaps, but mostly books. Now, books are just one of many things, not just books and magazines and newspapers you can have in the libraries. You can also have paintings, and you can have music, you can have movies, you can have videos, you can have lectures. 
you can also you know, visit monuments, and all of them without leaving your office. And this was not obvious, at least 50, 60 years ago when I started working on the computers. It was not obvious even 30 years ago, but we had inklings of, of it. And I just want to share with you that when I said online access to all information and knowledge, most of the information so far I talked about is passive. If you have an information in the book, there's nothing, it's not going to do anything for you. You have to read it, and you have to absorb it, and you have to figure out what you're going to do with it. But knowledge is active information, active, that if you can use it to solve problems. In one case, you have to absorb what is in the book, and then you figure out how to solve the problem. <coughs> But if the computer has knowledge, <coughs> it can, me, it can actively assist you in solving your problems. And this has already happened with the invention of iPhone and iP iPads and the apps that are coming on all of our tablet and smartphones. Basically, you can download, pay for and download hundreds of thousands of applications, each of which is an embodiment of a small piece of specialized knowledge to solve one problem. You know, and uh, what that problem might be for different people might be different things, but, uh, you know, if somebody if you want to see how to uh, <clears throat> have an agent which will look at your bank account all the time so that you don't have to be looking at it, and it will warn you when you're running out of money. That saves you time, because otherwise you would be worrying about it. Now you know. Uh, there is another app called Art Authority, where if you wanted to understand all the paintings by masters, you can, you, you know, you, you know, right now there's no way for any of us to appreciate them. With this little app costing about $10, all the Painter, you know, painting masters of the Western world are all available, every painting. I didn't know about all the paintings, you know, Leonardo da Vinci did. Now I can see them in, in, in a much greater detail. Than this. And the difference is, you could do that also by buying a book. <coughs> this provides random access. You can search it. You can look for critiques of the painting and all kinds of things that were not possible before. And if you haven't explored, um, you know, the app stores and app uh, options, and, uh, I'm sure some of you must have already contributed some. This is the quickest way for you to become a millionaire. And we had one student who just finished his PhD about three, four years ago. And on the side, he wrote some app you know, for something. And uh, then I saw him two years later. I said, what are you doing? He said, oh. Uh, I, my, I have an income every year of three, four hundred thousand dollars. I don't have to work, so I've decided to essentially explore what kinds of uh, new things I can do. He's a PhD from CMU in computer science, but he's not practicing whatever we taught. He's, he's become uh, independent, financially independent, and uh, so this is just recent. You know, there are lots of people. There are a group of students from SSM College in the South who are doing software engineering. They did an app on uh, silk screen printing uh, of one of the famous painters uh, from Pittsburgh, and that became instant, instantly famous. It turns out when the world is your market, when you have billions of people, even if you know 100,000 people buy it, you know, which is like 0.01%, you make a million dollars. So it's a very interesting ecosystem that's emerging that we didn't know about. So the idea here is all of these types of things should be instantly available anywhere in the world in any language. The first and the second is becoming available, but not yet the third. If, if you're not literate in English, 
then you're out of luck most of the time. And uh, if you're illiterate, too bad. So, however, that will change. That will change very soon. And it's just a matter of time. And uh, not only that, this, this technology says this information in digital form should be searchable. If it's purely a photograph, I can't search it. It must have attributes. It must be browsable and navigable by human beings and machines. It's very important to understand this distinction. Most of us think about all the books being available for human beings to read. But think about it. If you read one book every day from the time you're born to the time you die, let's say you live to be over 100 years old, you can only read 36,000 books. Right? So, there are over 125 million books in all the languages of the world that are being authored. So, you'll never have an opportunity to read and understand and absorb the total knowledge that is there. However, if you could think, imagine a world where you have a thousand agents, maybe on your body, in your suits, in your, in, your, in your body, all of which are doing your work for you. They read the book in finance, or painting, or culture, or history, or whatever it might be. And then, when, when a problem comes up related to that topic, it, it, that book agent will whisper in your ear. By the way, Benjamin Franklin already solved this problem. You don't have to solve it, or something like that. So, uh, so that you're not wasting time, you're also discovering who else has been doing such things. And many of them are lost in the, for history because many of the old manuscripts are just sitting in the libraries. I was visiting the Asiatic Library in Calcutta and, uh, you know, there are lots of things there that never see the light of day. They're just there gathering dust. They're amazing. Uh, my manuscript going back to pre-British days. So, uh, machines reading books and uh, is an important component of what we're talking about. Just to illustrate why it is disruptive, as a result of some of these changes we will talk about, many companies have gone bankrupt, Many new companies have emerged in the last 10 years, and the market cap of all these companies is close to a trillion dollars. So, for example, if you take the Apple, which has pioneered in music and, and uh, video phones and, uh, and other related things, if you just take those things, Apple is the most valuable company, depending on the day, with Exxon or Apple, they keep going up at a, at a valuation of over $320 billion. Just so that you have a good uh, idea of what that means, $320 billion, I think, translates to some 200,000 crores or much larger number than that. This company was on its feet, on its, on, its, uh, on its knees, just 15 years ago. In 1997, when Steve Jobs took over, it was about to go bankrupt. Nobody wanted it. Now it is the most valuable company. Why is it the most valuable company? It is giving people something they want. They want to listen to music. They want to watch movies. They want to do things. So they created a device called iPod, and iPod, has sold over 10 billion songs. They've created a brand new marketing business model and that's revolutionizing the way we uh, listen to music. And gone are the old 60, 78 RPM and 33 RPM and, and Walkmans and Discmans, all of them are gone. Now, is that a disruption? I don't know what you call it, but it's completely different and none of us imagined that would be the case in 1995. Simple as that. So I'm just saying 
So now let's take uh, another example. Oops. There's a company called Amazon and uh, they are selling more books today in electronic form than they're selling on physical form. And they're the largest seller of books in the world. And most of them, many of them in electronic form. And they have created a, a, a device, electronic device called Kindle. And I have one in my suitcase I carry with it. Uh, I, you know, and I find it much more easy because it fits right in my coat pocket. I can have it on the plane, I can take it out and read and then put it back in my coat pocket. I can't put a book, book in my coat pocket. I can't put, put many things in my coat pocket. And not only that, it has literally hundreds of books in there. And I'm not going to read all of them on that day, but at least I have them access. And many of the classics I wanted to read long ago, finally I'm getting to read. Because most of, many of the old books that are out of copyright, Amazon gives it to you for free. You can just, if you have the device, you can download it for free. So all of Dickens and all of Jane Austen, all of Shakespeare, everything you can download for free. Only if you want more recent books that are copyright, even those are much cheaper. So what has happened is Amazon currently has a market valuation of $80 billion. Okay. Now, the most valuable company in this country today is either TCS or Reliance Industries. And they're only valued at about 30, 40 billion dollars. And you say, why is that? Why is that? Because they're in either service or the low tech industries. <coughs> they're not kind of creating, you know, if you take TCS, you know, it's an IT company, but they're mainly body shop, right? They're selling body and human services. And it's limited by the number of people you can hire and train and provide uh, to do the work. Ultimately, we have to move away from that to create global products. And Tata and Nano try to do that. Hopefully, they'll succeed. But that's the kind of thing we need to do. We need to innovate on the global scale. And our own market. Uh, provides an incentive for that. We are 130 uh, billion people, uh, no, 1.3 billion people, uh, 130 crores, I think, yeah. So, uh, the, we need to kind of ponder, not my role, but the business school role. Somebody has to say, why is it we are not there? And it's clear that within 30, 40 years, America and in India will be number two economy after China ahead of the United States. And, uh, and we'll only get there, not just because of brute force strength and manpower, uh, people, but because we are innovating. And we are contributing to the innovation. And we are certainly capable of doing it. It's just that we haven't yet gotten the, the, uh, into the scheme of things. And the, there are a couple of things I put here. Uh, you can download movies, not only from Netflix, but also from Apple and also Amazon. Take cars, for example. Cars, you, you know, these days, the cars, you know, where you have to have a driver and you have to be careful and so on. And if the driver makes a mistake, you'll get in an accident, maybe sometimes you'll die. But we have already demonstrated technologies that put the cars with autonomous cars, which will drive themselves. And the day when you have cars, you make sure that you don't get an accident. Intelligent cruise control, accident avoiding cruise control is just around the corner. And that's what I said in 1995 when I lost a bet. I said, in 10 years, you'll be able to buy a car that will drive itself. And uh, Don Hennessy, who's currently the president of Stanford, and, and Gordon Bell, who were on the other side, they said, no way, it's not going to happen. And it happened. It turned out the Stanford uh, vehicle in 19, 2007, two years later than what I said, actually drove 50 kilometers or something in the uh, Darfur Grand Challenge drive. And I, you know, we were at a celebration, John Hennessy and I were there. I said, God, I never thought this was going to happen. I am amazed. 
because most people are skeptical of what can happen, what cannot happen. These things will happen. Sometimes you're off by a few years. And uh, this, at the same time, I also said, would that any one of us would be able to watch any movie of anything within 10 years. Because it was obvious to me, looking at fiber optic you know, bandwidth and revolution and so on, it should be possible to have infinite bandwidth at zero cost. And anybody can have as much bandwidth. You know? If you can have it, then downloading a movie and watching is not a big deal. It's okay, it's high definition movie. So anyway, there are lots of things that have already disrupted businesses, that have already created, you know, a trillion dollar businesses. And I'm saying it's just beginning. And the main impetus for all of them is access to information and knowledge, instantaneous access to information. So, and this is like building the Great Wall of China. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen in five years. Over the next 50, 100 years, it will increasingly become much more sophisticated and some, some more use of it. As from what I remember, to build the Great Wall of China, it took them 300 years, something like that. But they built it. And uh, the, the great thing about the digital libraries, the universal digital library of Wikipedia, it will go on forever because we are always creating new content. There is no stopping. It's not just something that will stop. So, uh, so I wanted now to come to the purpose of this talk, which is to talk to you about the work we'll be doing on the universal digital libraries. The original seed of this idea went close back to 1975. And, and, uh, and John McCarthy, because we were all producing our thesis already online, and he said, as long as they're online, why don't you put it uh, on, the web, on, the, on the net, on the net, so that other people can access it. So our access of documents was not invented with WWW and uh, Tim Berners-Lee. It was actually predicted and was seen to be possible as early as 75, just that Tim Berners-Lee created that particular structure was made easy for everybody. And uh, when I was the chief scientist in France for a few years at Centre Mondial, uh, they, I, I, at my suggestion, they also started digitizing trench books. At that time, there was no scanners, no desktop publishers were not there also at that point. They said, uh, we'll type it in. But uh, the senior people said, if you type it in, it'll be just text. In those days, the printers were these long you know, chain printers. And so you, it would come out looking ugly. You want our books that are pristine and beautiful, and we, you know, we don't want all this. And a couple of years later, by 1985, that uh, publishing was of age, and you could print any kind of document you wanted online. You know, so these, uh, in France, we started that. In but most of the interesting things happened since 1995. And about 2006 or seven, Google started scanning books and they have scanned over 15 million books. That's what you can do if you have a lot of money and you're willing to do it because you believe in the cause, right? So now I'd like to show you a video. The goal of the Universal Library is to make all rocket works created since the beginning of time instantly available to anyone, anywhere in the world, in any language. Advances in storage and compression techniques have made it possible to gather vast amounts of information in digital libraries and make them available all over the world. The internet, particularly the World Wide Web, makes it possible to deliver this information nearly instantaneously anywhere on the planet. Let's now take a look at some of the materials contained in the Universal Library and how to access them. We're looking at a high-resolution color image of a cactus flower from an antique botanical print. The original of this print is rare and fragile and is normally inaccessible to human beings, but through the Universal Library, it can be made available to researchers all over the world. To look at other material in the Universal Library, we just go back to the home page and select books, for example. 
This gives a menu of some of the books that are available now in the Universal Library. We can take a look at some of the antique books that are in the public domain, choosing here the History of New England, a book from 1847. This screen enables the user to configure the system to produce a display tailored to his particular computer. Now I can go in and look at an actual scanned image of the book, The History of New England, written by Lilly in the year 1847. And here we see the book exactly as it exists, uh, even with discoloration. Looking at a different book, here's one, for example, looks by Charles Dickens. We can look at the full text of Oliver Twist and instantaneously access any chapter. Begin reading, print the book out, whatever we'd like to do. Through the Universal Library, we can access newspapers from all over the world. Here, for example, from the different continents, we can access a Japanese newspaper, the Japan Times. These are today's headlines, November 4th, 1997. If you want to look at a particular article? Sorry. I was not sure this video was made in 1997. In Japan Times. <laughs> Through the Universal Library, you can actually listen to music. Here, for example, some works by Mozart. intriguing capabilities of the Universal Library is its ability to present video. Here we're looking at a technical tutorial on Windows NT. an outline of the technical talk, and we can select individual sections and go to them immediately. So the reason I showed it to you is even though these ideas may only be becoming routinely available for general public now, and the, how that they could be done and how they should be done. Everything was known 20 years ago. It just takes time for society to adapt to the technological changes, the cost and the availability and ease of use. And uh, I keep saying to our, my computer science friends, computers should be as easy to use as a telephone or a television so that even an illiterate person that, that, that cannot read should be able to use it. Until that time, you know, we will not be able to kind of find the right application. So anyway, uh, I'm going to quickly go through a whole bunch of slides because we're running short of time. We've scanned over two billion books in the Human Selective Project, but that has been overtaken by Google, where they scanned 15 million books. And here are some books that are old Indian books. There's a major, there was a major effort on India. And here is another book from Indian Life is Fair, published in 1873 on the theory of life. If you remember, the quantum theory mechanics and quantum theory was not invented by that time. It only came later. And by, you know, by uh, not Einstein, but Max Planck was the first one to add it. He said there seemed to be some quantum mechanics. And uh, there is a book about tools. Here is a book in Tamil. Here is a book in Urdu. Here is a book in Arabic. If you go to our libraries in the country, it's amazing that the kind of books and the you know age of the books that are there. It's just
just that most of us can access it and can search it and can read it and find it. I think this is you know, the French book of structural molecules. Again, goes back to 1925. That was the time, you know, the whole debate about you know atoms and molecules and atomic theory and everything was kind of great. And uh, so <coughs> the, the next major thing I'm hoping will happen. Many some help from a trip like IIT here is what I call a uh, thousand newspapers for the next thousand years. K squared and P project. You know, and it turns out newspapers were only published, started to be published around 1850. The first New York Times is about around that time. There were papers in England before that, the weekly papers and so on, that goes back to 1700s. If you look at some of them, they're very interesting. They would be little classified ads saying four goats for sale or something like that. Because they, you know, that was uh, at that time an important uh, asset. And so uh, there are a lot of very interesting things going back, but it's, the newspaper is only a 200 year old phenomenon. And there are lots of things there we find fascinating today to be. And I was saying to myself, what about my great great grandson? Would he be able to look at what we used to think and what we used to do? Wouldn't it be nice if all the newspapers of today in all languages were available to him? Now the question of course is in the old days all the newspapers would come along on paper and you could print it, you can scan it as an image. But now every book, newspaper is printed in digital technology. Digital technology. There's a software package called Quark Express which lays out the entire paper and then it's shipped to the you know, printing press. They make an image in the printing plate and then the printing. It's all digital. So before it goes, you can, you can tell Quark Express, save this as a PDF file rather than a thing. And it turns out we can do that. And I've counted the number of bits and bytes in uh, New York Times and the most of these papers. I mean, it's about no more than a megabyte, including photographs, color photographs. Most Indian newspapers per day use less than 200 kilobytes. Very interesting because they're only like eight pages long. If you add all the ads and the ads and everything would be there. And the online newspapers, them, they don't have all the ads. And what you want is the actual Quark Express output that's going because that's a historical document. It shows what kinds of things are of interest to be advertised, commercial, the matrimonials, everything are interesting after 200 years. So, if you do the counting, each newspaper is about a megabyte per day. In a year, it will be 365 megabytes. Forget about 365, let's say it's a gigabyte, three, three times as much. And now, each newspaper for one year is one gigabyte, and in a thousand years it's a terabyte. And a terabyte you can buy today, you know, for maybe ten, uh, uh, maybe hundred dollars or something like that. There used to be a time when I bought ten megabytes of disk space for that in 1971 for two million dollars. So uh, this exponential technology of disks, for example, has been changing so fast that um, uh, we will be able to have uh, all of a newspaper with 1,000 pages in a terabyte. 1,000 newspapers is only a petabyte. As a single archive, we can, the world can afford to have it. It will cost less than a million dollars. Okay. So the question is, if you had such a thing, you know, it would be the most wonderful historical document, historical resource for every student here, every student anywhere. But it's not happening because of legal problems, copyright problems. And I kind of went to Delhi and talked to various ministries and so on, and ministers. It doesn't sink in yet, but I think it will. I remember I used to, I used to do the same thing in the 80s. There used to be a minister for electronics. I went to him and I said, you have to start worrying about email. 
he didn't understand what I was talking about. <laughs> and then I was talking to somebody else. I said, you know, we need a tablet to be able to write on it. He said, tablet? Are you talking about granite tablet? No, something like that. So he had no clue. And uh, so it turns out, you know, we have to deal with, you know, systems and bureaucracies which are not yet fully aware of the potentials. And you have to be patient. You don't get you know, upset. And, but ultimately it will happen. And that's the, that's the beauty of all this. Just the question of 20 more years. So the newspaper project is one of the things I'm hoping we can start. And the IIT, I'm hoping, will be one of the, toward the leadership. The magazines are the same thing. The main things, this is already happening, and in fact, uh, but there are a lot of Indian paintings, Mughal miniatures, and all kinds of things that are unique to our culture that are not there. And again, we need to figure out a way of doing this. The music, you know, a lot of you know, American music, if you, even if you go to YouTube and type Mozart, and you'll see all the music of Mozart, you can visit any of that right now. And whereas Indian music is not there, some of it, most of it is that is there, it's all bootleg and illegal and pirated and all these things. And it's not very high quality of So, as I said, this is a like printing paper from China. So there are lots of very interesting research problems. If you're a computer scientist, you have to worry about what will happen when this is, when this is a reality. My expectation is a billion people will access this resource. A billion people. And uh, we don't know many good systems that are accessed by billion people. Google is probably the largest such access now, it's 40 million. This is like 20 times as large. So, and it also has to be easy to use every time you try to access something. It cannot expect you to be a brilliant PhD to do all kinds of things. It must be accessible to an illiterate person. And think about it. That means they must, they, must, they must be able to speak to the computer. There's already at least one device that's routinely available, the iPhone 4S, which was released a few months ago, where you can speak, anybody can speak, and it works. And most of the time, it's not perfect, but it's only works in English. So why don't we have them in Telugu, and Bengali, and Telugu, and whatever language you want? They should be able to build it. But we haven't, and we hope, we hope we'll, we'll do that. And multilingual integration with Google, already some of this is happening here at IIT. And uh, translation and summarization are hard problems. That is, I can give any of you a book and say summarize it, write me a 40 page summary of it. You, you can do it with no problem. But we don't know how to produce a summary using a computer. That may take us another 20, 30, 50 years. If I can produce a summary, then I can. That means I understand what is in there. That's very important. Yeah. So there are a lot of unfinished agendas. These are the library of newspapers, these are the library of monuments, these are the library of lectures. I don't know. The MPTEL lectures that we have here is a very important resource. But one of the great things that has happened in the last month, actually, in the last uh, six months or so ago, Stanford announced Stanford Online. They're making lectures available online. Not only that, they're actually saying, we'll give you a certificate every time you take it. But you have to do all the assignments. And they have created an automatic evaluation of the assignments. MIT and CMU, which used to be the pioneers in this area, MIT especially, are flat-footed because Stanford you know, kind of doing something much more than just putting up some PowerPoint slides and saying they put up the lectures online. And so MIT recently announced a thing called MIT X, where they are actually going to permit students anywhere in the world to take their courses, and they will give a certificate. I predict it's just the beginning. In two years, maybe 10, maybe 20, you'll be able to get an MIT degree if you do all the work that is required. It may not cost anywhere close to $70,000 a year. 
and and all that is saying is you know the stuff, you know, you have a union card, you know the material and you can be employed. And uh, with an MIT degree, IIT degree, that's one of the things we need to talk about. This becomes very important because in India, three crores of children, 30 million children are born roughly every year. And at least 30% of them should go to university. Right now, only 8% of the kids that are born go to universities in India. We are way behind and we don't have the physical structure, capacity or anything to do that. And I think ultimately, uh, this may be the way that that problem will get resolved when online education. I don't know when, when but uh, I, I see that. So we need a scalable quality solution for 100 million learners. So in conclusion, in Tomorrowland, we will see many disruptive changes. We won't go to the libraries. The libraries will come to us. We won't go to the movies. The movies will come to us. We won't drive cars. The cars will drive us. We won't go to the universities, they will come to us. And we won't visit Taj Mahal, the Taj Mahal will visit us. This is already the future. Only a few things are not yet ready, but you know, I didn't talk about virtual tourism, which will create some jobs also, but I believe all of these. And IIT Karakpur is in a unique position in India make this transformation happen. You are the preeminent educational institution in the country. And you have the really most brilliant children students as your students. And you give them any problem, they will solve it. You only have to give them problems that you think are unsolvable. They don't know that, but that's okay. He said, solve it, and they will solve it. And, uh, and this is not just a joke. In the process, we will create many billionaires. So, you have to now ponder whether the future we are talking about is disruptive, way that we will live, learn, and work in the future, or just the future of how we will learn. Thank you.